this is the aims and outcomes for today. So the aim is to understand what is meant by person centeredness and recognise ways to um, ways we all co-create and develop person centered cultures. We will explore a wee bit um, in detail and um, look at the definitions and description of person centeredness. So what does that mean? We'll also look at a uh, culture and lastly, we'll, we'll start to think about how do we recognise ways that we all co-create um, and can evaluate person centred cultures. So um, to begin with, uh, we're just going to start off. What is person centredness? What does it mean? So the term person centeredness is often used in health and social care um, and we'll work with what is shared on the slide today. So this is from Brendan McCormack and colleagues um, and they have a wealth of experience in person centeredness. They're researchers, academics and, and have led at least two decades of work in the development on person centeredness and enabling person centered cultures. So this statement really highlights um, and recognise all persons are valued partners and I'll let you just take a, a, a minute or so to read what is there. Um, it speaks about relationships. It underpins, um, that is underpinned by uh, mutual respect and understanding and shared experiences. So if we think of the people who deliver care um, as well as those receiving care and their significant others when we're thinking about person centeredness. So we're speaking about all interactions, team members, other multidisciplinary team members, patient, family and carers. So this really encompasses everyone when we're, th when we're speaking about person centeredness. And moving on. Um, yep, so and we specifically use the term person centeredness and um, we are aware that there's uh, the term patient centered used as well. Um, but like Natalie alluded to there, we very much focus on the idea of person centeredness as being more than just the patient. Um, and one of the key things we kind of take away from the, the definition given before is that it's between all care providers and service users and other significant to them in their lives. Um, and evidence shows that, you know, although we, what we, we are primarily there for the patient, <clears throat> the interactions of how we treat each other, how we treat families, um, how we uh, work in an in interdisciplinary context, um, all these things are as equally as important as being focused on the needs of the patient as so it's not just about being patient centred, it's about being person centred in your interactions with um, other um, colleagues and um, members of the, the complex network of interactions that we have. Um, so if you hear patient centred, um, I would challenge that. Um, it's not always going to be right, it's not always going to be wrong. And just similarly, I'd also challenge person centredness because I do you actually mean person centred in the context of um, all the people you'll meet or did they are they using person centeredness as in as a, a placeholder for patient centeredness and if anyone's any comments about that please feel free to stick it in the chat and we'll we'll, uh, we'll come to it um and there's a growing body of evidence around person centeredness um because uh, it recognizes a link between um internal and external partnerships and relationships and the importance of culture which we'll speak about today um, the positive association between good culture and good outcomes and a whole raft of uh, different things like service performance, quality of care, user experience, staff experience. All these things are signs of, um, uh, you know, if there's a good link between good culture and good outcomes, all these things should be involved. And if there's person centred cultures in place, then evidence base shows links between increased staff morale and motivation, uh, people feeling listened to, valued, um, a greater staff, staff satisfaction and engagement, um, staff wellbeing and psychological health, and employee uh, improved employee retention, which is obviously a major thing. And that's coming from a, a, a recent source. And I suppose people could be easily be thinking, well, why does this matter? Um, a wise understanding person centered culture is important um, and what we often do when we are um, running our programs and NHS day side is kind of highlight um, where things have where things have gone wrong and 
um, what often comes from um, you know, incidents that have happened uh, where you know uh, small or big incidents have happened quite often you'll find that uh, cultures at the heart of it um, you know things have become permissible places aren't psychologically safe for error reporting um, and quite often although the things have taken place quite often you know it's not necessarily individuals to who are to blame it's culture itself that is um, uh, the actual problem and um, what we often find is when things go wrong they can really go wrong and um, poor culture can have absolutely catastrophic consequences thank you andy so we're moving on to what is culture um, and what do we mean by culture? So you might be familiar with this graphic. I think it is a really powerful visual um, and always important to share. Um, an iceberg is all about what you see and what you don't see. Um, and I suppose if we look at this, um, this graphic here, what you see above the waterline is related to the, the way we, see, we say we get things done. So this can be strategy, policies, structures, shared values, vision, goals, things like that. Um, and I suppose thinking about that in, in much more depth, have you seen or experienced times where you've seen shared values or a vision statement um, that's been displayed in an area, but maybe they're just words um, to you and you're not sure of the purpose of them or maybe haven't seen them being demonstrated in the way that people interact with each other. And we mean that with all people, all persons, the way the team interact and the way that um, other people um, are, are um, interacting. So below the waterline um, are the things related to the way we really get things done, such as the beliefs we hold, the shared assumptions, the traditions, the values and the norms, um, unwritten rules, the stories and the feelings. And these are generally the things that are developed through time and considered valid, therefore are passed on to others as the correct way to perceive, think and feel. Um, and I suppose from my own perspective, I can th really think about, it resonates with me and I can think about times where I've experienced and been part of things like that. So those norms and daily rituals, such as, you know, um, refreshing the water jugs at a certain time of day, um, the lights being switched on at a certain time of day, them being turned off at a certain time of day. Um, everyone sitting up by their bedside to have their breakfast and these are just to name but a few the list really goes on and um, on so I suppose what I'm really trying to um, highlight here is that culture is learned it is passed on um, it's sometimes about fitting in um, with that culture but it's also important to know um, and remember that culture can be changed and it is key to organisational excellence. So what does person-centeredness mean? And what does culture mean? If we're looking at another um, good quote um, from uh, McCormack, Brendan McCormack and Tanya McCance's work, um, if you read that definition there, that is really speaking about understanding person-centeredness refers to all people um, and when we really think about the culture that um, we're part of so it's about the importance of healthful relationships and um, between all involved where everyone feels valued listened to respected and can shape and um, this can be shaped by their own experiences so um, the next steps are shaped by that so a colleague once said to me, for people to experience um, person-centeredness um, and person-centered cultures, um, they really have to experience that themselves. Um, and I thought that really resonated with me. It really um, stayed with me um, to think about it like that.
Um, so we'll move on to, we have a video here. Um, you get a little bit more of Natalie, a little bit less of me, um, uh, of a conversation she had with um, someone who had attended one of our practice development programmes on the NHST side, um, speaking about uh, personal centeredness and values and vision. My name is Natalie uh, Beattie, I'm practice development um, nurse in NHS Tayside um, and I'm here today to speak about developing person-centred cultures. So I'll just hand it over to you Laura if you want to just introduce yourself and then I'll, I'll ask some questions after that if that's okay. Thank you Natalie. So my name's Laura Campbell and I'm a primary care link worker here in Dundee. Lovely, thank you. So, um, Laura, I was just going to ask some questions in and around uh, values and vision and what they mean to you and what they mean to the, the team that you work with. So um, I'm just going to start off uh, with that first question. So, and I, please just take your time and just think about um, uh, how you want to answer that. Um, but. So when did you start thinking about values and shared values and vision? To be honest with you, I hadn't really given it much thought. I hadn't really thought about how my own personal values impacted on my day to day practice. Um, it was until I'd gone on a transformational practice development course and that really stripped things back and made me realise how much of a part our, you know, our intrinsic values actually do play in the roles that we take on private life and very much so work life as well. Thank you and in what ways so what values really stood out to you and what you know, what was the the ways that you you demonstrated them? So I've always tried to abide by that old um, you know your parents always drummed it into you treat others how you would like to be treated yourself and you know we try to do that as much as we can in day-to-day -day life I think but that really struck me that in terms of the care we provide um, if we do really take that kind of thing forward in terms of kindness and empathy and honesty it can really make a difference to the type of care that we're able to provide patients um, I think if people tell that you're being authentic it helps build the trust and relationship so much easier and so much more quickly. Um, and at the end of the day, I think that's what really makes a difference in terms of person-centred care. Thank you, Laura. What I'm really hearing there is it's just it's a way of being. It's just who you are every day. Um, thank you. So just sort of going on to that that next element of that. So. Um, you said you, you sort of were introduced to that um, through a, a transformational practice development programme and that made you really think about it. How did you how did you take those thoughts and reflections back to the, the team that you, you worked with and, and how did you explore that together? We're quite lucky in that um, our team leader was really invested in um, helping us come together as a team so we were able to have some um, team development time put aside especially like specifically to really look at who we are what our service is and what we wanted to deliver so that gave us the kind of protected time to all come together and just build that kind of safe and open chat basically um, and it was just really eye-opening to have that time with our colleagues you know out with the normal working dimensions of stripping things right back and I remember one of the quotes in the course I'd done was um, you know about really looking at the very base level of who we are what we want to do um, I forget the wee tagline <laughs> but yeah it was all about really stripping it back and looking at what we wanted to deliver so how do we make that happen and doing that together Thank you. And what I'm really hearing there as well is it's about those demonstration of behaviours that are linked so closely to the values that we hold really, really dear and actually speaking about those with your colleagues as well. You just you get to know people at a much deeper level and maybe, you know, what they are finding challenging, but similarly, what are they really, really flourishing in as well? Um, so is that a uh, when you're speaking about eye opening, was that part of that in um, those conversations? Definitely. Um, I think we're all sometimes a wee bit not guilty, but, you know, 
you can kind of lean towards making assumptions about people whenever you've maybe worked with them for quite a long period of time or a shorter period of time but it's very one-dimensional the way you see people um, and we all kind of come with our own preconceived ideas and things so I think having those really basic conversations about our values it really helped us to realign ourselves in terms of like we are all here for the same reason and we do share a common objective and just having that kind of human aspect again it sounds maybe a bit over the top but I think sometimes we lose that in the procedures and stuff um, but whenever deconstruct to reconstruct that's what I was trying to think of whenever we pulled it right back and really looked at you know we are all empathetic we are in this profession for a reason do you know what I mean we want to help people we all have the same challenges to a certain degree you know the writing reflex and all these other things that we struggle with so um, being able to really form stronger bonds I would say in terms of the shared values um, really it was really quite eye-opening and quite enlightening. Thank you and that's yeah it's a really um sort of safe, open, honest space um, to be in once you start having those conversations. And I suppose, did, did those conversations and those agreed shared values really um, support uh, writing a vision? Because you were speaking about actually that it was really helpful to know why we do what we do um, day to day. Or did you already have a vision um, as a team, but it really strengthened that? To be honest with you, the vision is another thing that I'd kind of always looked at a wee bit tokenistically. I hadn't really fully invested in it because you kind of get used to seeing, you know, <laughs> it sounds a bit cynical, but I certainly hadn't given it enough attention because I didn't really understand the point of it. I suppose it's like anything, if you're not really fully on board with it, um, you don't pay it enough attention. So. I think we'd started having a vision um, a way back whenever the team first expanded, but it hadn't really been knuckled down, like it hadn't really been pinned down. So this gave us the opportunity to really start by looking at the values um, and just structuring the vision from those so that it all held meaning to us then. Um, and it really helped resharpen our focus and things like that and realised, like I say, you know, we are all on the same hymn sheet. Um, although some of the procedural stuff can still be a wee bit tricky or whatever, you know, if you keep going back to that shared vision and values, it just helps tighten the ship, I think. Thank you. Yeah, it really resonates with me as well. It did just give that grounding um, of knowing why we do what we do. And I suppose, did it help to speak about the challenges? I'm hearing you saying about, you know, there, there are still things that, that need to be done every single day um, within the services that we provide and as a team. Did it help um, sort of exploring those challenges together, having those shared agreed values and that vision that you were all working towards? Absolutely. Um, our manager picked up on the fact that we were having much more challenging conversations. Um, and I use the word challenging because, you know, they were difficult. Um, whenever you have differences of opinions, sometimes it, it can be difficult. You know, people shy away from conflict. But I think the difference was it wasn't conflict anymore because we did have the ability to kind of take a moment and reflect and see where the other person was coming from. So that allowed us to share our opinions um, a lot more freely, but also a lot more considered, if that makes sense, um, because we were doing it in a better grounding of openness and honesty, but respect as well. Yeah, that, yeah, again, I suppose it's what I'm hearing there is it's that um, ongoing conversations and those ongoing commitment to having and living those shared agreed values and vision and that it doesn't happen as a one off. Yeah, definitely. That's something I would say to really, you know, it's a constant thing um, and it gives more opportunities the more that you do go back to these conversations and the more you implement it. Um, you know, it's all about continuing to learn best practice and stuff and nobody's perfect. So sometimes it's having a wee reminder of hold on, what do I want to convey here and where am I coming from, where are they coming from and try to find that middle ground again as well. Thank you. Laura, and I suppose just to summarise it for the people that are watching um, today and, and can maybe resonate with some of the things that you've shared, 
what one piece of learning would you really share with others in and around this whole process? So knowing your own values, agreeing shared values with the team that you work with and um, agreeing a vision, a shared vision. Come with an open mind. Um, I know that gets said a lot, but I think it really is true because, as I say, we do come with preconceived ideas. You know, we've maybe been side by side with people and we think we know them, but it's really enlightening and enriching. Um, and it can really help develop yourself and your colleagues if you come to it and just be ready to actually just listen and take on board what everybody else is saying because you'll learn something new about you but also them as well, I would hazard a wee bet on, to be honest. Um, so yeah, just be open and just go with it. Thank you so much, um, Laura. I really appreciate you um, sharing a part of your journey today. I know it's just um, the beginning of a lifelong journey, um, but I really appreciate you sharing that with not only um, myself, but the other people that are watching today. And I wish you well in the rest of your steps. Thank you, Natalie. We always stress that everybody has a, a role in enabling person centered cultures. Um, and quite often, especially these days, um, these things are within our codes of conduct and healthcare, healthcare strategies, and certainly within um, our pillars of practice, um, the, our role in enabling person centered cultures. So when it comes to whose job is this, um, it's very much um, everyone's. Um, and and what we we're saying earlier on about it not being someone else's job to instill culture, it, it's how we all interact with each other. This is um, the person centered practice framework, um, and we um, this is something that we use again from um, Tanya McCants and Brendan McCormack, um, who are sort of leading academics on uh, person centeredness and practice development. Um, about how um, how best we can um, underpin our activities with uh, with uh, theory. So I don't know if this is um, familiar to people. Um, Natalie will speak about the person centred processes in a second, um, and I'll just go through the outer rings um, there. And we do find this quite useful, and it kind of puts everything into context. And so outside there, you've got the macro context, which is you know quite often. Um, depending on where you sit in the organisation, what your role is, you'll actually have very little to do with with those sort of things because these are like the strategic leadership and policy frameworks and all that kind of thing that seem to kind of come out um, <clears throat> you know, thick and fast from government or uh, large organisations or from your own organisation. Um, and although there'll be opportunities to kind of feedback and these sort of things, quite often these are the things that you've got very little sort of control over. That next inner ring. That's the prerequisites. So it's what you can need to have in place for um, to have a person centered culture or a healthful culture. Um, people need to be professionally com competent. Um, there's a commitment to the job um, communication skills and personal skills. But one of the key ones that we always focus on in practice development um, and in our team is this idea of no one's self. Um, and we are, we are big on that. We spend a lot of time on it. Um, we um, we believe, and one of the cores of uh, practice development and person centeredness is you can't really get to know others unless you know yourself, and you don't know your values, um, you don't know your um, essentially what makes up you, what upsets you, what your strengths are. Um, knowing yourself and how you're going to approach things is um, is key, and we're always keen to uh, uh, to stress that. And then um, at the the next one, the 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 that what that green one there, that is the practice environment. And I keep looking at my notes here because it's too small on my screen to see what's actually written in the middle. So apologies for that. But uh, that's the practice environment, and this is where you can, you know, like the what you can do within your own areas and all that sort of stuff really begins to have an effect because um, although you can't control everything in your practice environment, it is your local area, do you know, um, you have a greater voice in how things are done. Um, do you know, and so, some of it will be sort of said to you uh, as, as kind of gospel that you can't break, but absolutely, you know, you have a greater voice within your own area and sphere of control. You can't do what the next ward doing or the next area is doing. 
um, you can't influence that necessarily, but within your own area, uh, that's where you can start to make changes um, in and around making things more person centred, both for patients and for uh, you and your colleagues. We're just going to concentrate on the the centre part, the central part of this model. So, um, it's the person centred processes. It looks like petals um, of a flower, and we often um, refer to it as that when we're speaking about it um, within our team. So, these are the elements that we all have an opportunity to apply every single day, day to day, as a way of being, um, and reflect and learn upon. So when we break it down um, through these uh, petals and these uh, processes, and these are for everyone, regardless um, of role, it's it's a day to day um, way of being, as I said. So we'll focus on the first part there. So it's working with um, beliefs and values. And Laura spoke about that in the video that, um, that she shared. So what really matters um, to us as people and others as persons um, really enables a good understanding of ourselves and others. So who we are, what motivates us, what's important to us in terms of our values and beliefs, and they in turn um, drive our behaviours. So it is really important to, to work with those um, values and beliefs. Um, engaging authentically is the, the um, next petal, um, and that is about engaging all persons um, in decision making by considering their values and our own values, the experiences that we share, any concerns um, or future goals and aspirations. So it's really about um, understanding each other. It's it's not about it's not necessarily about um, individuals, but it's about um, knowing what we see um, and how we connect with each other. And that's sort of linked. I've taken it right into sharing decision making. Um, so it is about really understanding um, individuals and ourselves um, when we're making those shared decisions. Um, being sympathetically present, um, and that can sometimes be a, a bit more challenging um, to explain um, to others, um, because it can be quite, it can be linked quite closely to um, empathy as well. But what I always say is, it's not about walking in other people's shoes, um, in that you, when somebody's sharing something with you, it's what they're experiencing, what they're feeling in those moments. And you can absolutely be present and listen and, and try to understand what they're going through. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily um, experience the same thing or have the same feeling. So it's about really actively listening and understanding and recognising that everybody's unique um, as a person. That last um, petal there is uh, working holistically, and that's about connecting um, with others. And it really pays attention to the whole person and not solely what they're presenting with at that moment in time. So taking time to know who they are um, within their, their physical sense, psychological sense, um, sociocultural sense and spiritual well-being. So connecting it all and really getting to know um, each other. Um, yourself and the, the other person that you're having that conversation with um, in that moment. So that is a wee bit of a whistle stop tour of person centred processes, but just taking the time um, to really look at look at that and reflect upon it, it is absolutely about the things that we do um, every single day as a way of being and they, all, they are all interlinked. If we think about co-creating conditions, so enabling person-centred um, um, cultures. As we've spoke about um, through Laura's video and through the other slides that have been shared today, um, shared values is really important um, as a building block um, to co-creating conditions. So knowing yourself and knowing others. So we are obviously referring to the team that you work with and the people that you work with, as well as those who are receiving care as well. So shared values is really important. A really good um, thing just before we move on uh, um, to the next one is values drive behaviours and behaviours drive culture. So it is a really, really important building block. 
The most effective teams um, are the ones that are curious and ask critical questions of the team and in each and of each other. So the who, what, why questions. And I've seen some of that in the chat and um, what we've shared in the round. It's some people say these are things that we do day to day just because it's the way we do it around here. So just ask it, why do we do it like that? Um, can we try something different and what could be better? Um, a really good Albert Einstein quote is, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Just, so start being curious and asking those questions and working through the challenges and celebrating what's working well as well. The next one is about feedback. So. How do we ask as individuals for feedback and who do you ask and is the purpose clear and do you have time and space um, to discuss in the feedback um, with that person that you're requesting from? Um, we, within our team, um, we speak about feed forward as well, so that's another option. So thinking about um, framing things slightly differently um, and a maybe asking questions in the round in the future how do we do this or the next time how do we do that it's just changing it to a feed forward and celebrate so celebrate what is going really well um often the, those are the motivators and the energizers we need um, as individuals and teams um, to celebrate those successes um, to spark the, the energy and the motivation to continue to work through making improvements. And it also gives opportunity to um, create, create a bit of pause and take stock of what is um, going on around us. So those are they don't cover everything that co-creates um, the conditions of enabling person-centred cultures, but it's a good starting point. And I'll just hand over. Isn't that like, so asking questions differently to better understand and explore culture. What kind of questions and what can we do in and around um, in and around these? First thing you could ask yourself and ask your colleagues, you know, how does it feel to work here? Do you know, quite often, uh, you know, if there's issues with culture or good things with culture, you'll, you're going to know about it or most people will know about it. So asking the honest question, how does it feel to work here uh, and why? Um, what are all forms of feedback telling us? And we all have to, or are always asking, you know, answering things like I matter and um, various other tools that are deployed or forms or care opinion or, or whatever it is, either as a patient or, or as a member of staff. But what are these things telling us <clears throat> and not being afraid of the answers? Um, because sometimes you'll ask something and you you expect certain answers to come back and there'll always be answers to come back that you didn't expect. But they're as valid as the ones that you did expect. Are there things here that get in the way of best practices and what are they? And that ties into what Natalie was speaking about earlier on about culture in terms of um, the way things have already always been done around here. Um, you know, the, the things sitting above the waterline in that iceberg picture. Um, you know, the, you know this, the, the values and visions that are espoused and then the ones that are actually driving things underneath the waterline. Um, you know, the, the norms and the, the historical practices and all those sort of things. And then are there opportunities for sharing ideas, testing changes and learning together? A, a positive person-centred culture should be full of opportunities for sharing ideas and testing changes and learning together. If that's not happening, then it's probably not a positive person-centred culture <laughs> because those are the things that you're not being involved in the decision making, you're not getting your voice heard, and um, your ideas aren't being listened to. Um, for a positive person-centred culture, you really should be are there, where are those opportunities? Are people taking advantage of them? Um, are people using them? And if they're not happening, why aren't they happening? Got another video for you here um, with uh, a couple of members of our team, uh, Gemma, who's a healthcare support worker and Honor, who's a midwife. Hi Gemma, thanks for agreeing to chat today about your experience of person-centeredness in the workplace and some of the challenges that you might have faced. I wondered if there was an experience that you could share with us that 
um, helps us to better understand the experience of staff as persons um, in the workplace. Hi, Honor. Thank you for having me along to chat about uh, my experience. Um, yes, I would like to share an experience about a time where I worked in a very high pressured, uh, busy admissions area. Um, and um, within this area, we had a project that we weren't part of as a healthcare support worker workforce. Um, but within this project, we were uh, the key um, people that were driving this project forward. Um, and some of that project um, was maybe not very person centred for us in the workforce. So when you describe it as not being person centeredness, what did you experience as somebody who was involved in planning and organising care and working with the multidisciplinary team in terms of um, yeah, how did you feel when it, when it all started to happen, when, it, when this bundle was, was put into place? So yeah, they um, decided to come out with this um, project in relation to uh, a bundle. So you were meant to see your patients, assess them within 60 minutes. So this was carrying out observations, bloods and ECGs. Um, as the healthcare support worker workforce, um, we were the ones that obviously are very patient facing role, um, interact with our patients on a day to day uh, basis, really know our patients. Um, and a lot of us were quite skilled in, in these skills that they asked us to do. And um, we weren't actually involved in the project. And um, we were told about this project about a week or two before implementing the project. Um, and yes, um, it wasn't very person centred. It did challenge us in our values as colleagues. Um, and I'm sure that challenge had itself for um, patients too as well. That's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we always think that we're doing things in the best way that we can by involving people, you know, getting our stakeholders around the table. And I wondered if you reflect upon it now, if you had been one of those stakeholders around the table when that planning was going on, how do you think you could have been able to influence um, how it was implemented? Yeah, I think I would have probably brought my curiosity to the table a wee bit there. I think I would have brought uh, along the voice of other healthcare support workers around that table and being that advocate for patients as well. Um, I feel we didn't get the opportunity to challenge this or we didn't get the opportunity to really seek to understand why this was happening and um, we never really got to know what the background of the reasoning behind this bundle was. Um, so yeah, I think um, Definitely wasn't a stakeholder involvement with that one. And I think, yeah, we could have really brought uh, the voice of healthcare support workers and patients to the table with this one. Thank you for sharing that. It's really important because when we think about working with people's values, it makes me wonder then if this was supporting your values and the way that you like to work. And was there an opportunity to engage with the values of the people that you were caring for um, as you were carrying out that task? which does feel really tasky and less holistic care. So how did that feel being in that space? And how did you feel, how did you work within your values or which values did you have to push to the side a little bit to be able to function as part of that um, care bundle? Yeah, almost, um, I would say almost my integrity um, to a certain extent, I didn't feel that I was able to uphold that integrity. Like I said, it, it did cut across my values. Um, I didn't feel like I had respect as a colleague to not even be told about the project and then to implement this project with patients and other colleagues and um, not having that awareness about you know the reasoning why this was happening and um, you know the respect from other people um, yeah and just being recognized for what we do within our role as healthcare support workers and what we could have brought to the table with that one. Thanks for sharing. I wonder if so if you were reflecting on a day when you were working in, in that way, what would that look like for you now? And if you had the opportunity to go back and influence that in the future, would you be doing it a different way? So I suppose, first of all, could you describe what that day would be like? What, what the worst case is? And mm -hmm. if you could if you could you know, influence and mould that in a different way, what would that look like? Yeah, so. 
On a worse day, um, if you were the healthcare that was uh, carrying out the 60 minute bundle, um, you would be doing that task for a good 12 hour shift. So you'd be constantly doing the same thing over and over and over again almost robotically um, in a sense because you had targets to meet and obviously pressures from from high up as well to, to try and get these patients assessed and and moved on and, and meet certain organizational targets um, I think reflecting back now looking at my own codes of conduct my own values I think if I was to be put in that situation again I think I would have maybe challenged it slightly in a way of maybe thinking actually should we cut up the workload here should I be doing it for a few hours at a time and another colleague because I wasn't getting the interaction that I love being as a healthcare support worker with my patients um, which are the fundamentals of care and um, I felt I was more task focused than I was actually people focused and um, so I think yeah if, if we kind of um, came to an understanding of right okay this is this is what is happening we can't change it but how can we change it as people to make it better for ourselves definitely um, a few hours at a time rather than it being the whole day situation. Thank you and reflecting back is so important isn't it because sometimes we go along with things because you know we're in that space and we believe it's the right thing to do but actually having the strength and the voice and the and the embedded values to actually challenge things is is quite is quite challenging in itself was there anything that stood out as the biggest challenge for you whilst whilst you were doing that or one thing that you thought gosh this doesn't feel like i'm delivering the best care was there anything that stood out for you particularly as a as somebody with embedded values and somebody who does live, live around the person-centred practice framework um, certainly now in your new post and how, how, how would you describe that time? Yeah I think what stood out for me really was um, there was a day that I was on this task focus project um, for I think it was like three days straight we were quite short staffed in the area at the time and I could see the stress of my other colleagues trying to to attend to patients needs and I felt like it was a struggle for me to take away from what I was tasked with to then support them it wasn't until I actually went home that night that I just had this sinking feeling in my stomach that I just felt that I wasn't doing the job that I signed up to do as a healthcare support worker, which was be there for my colleagues, be there for my patients um, and be there for myself. And um, it wasn't until I went home that night that I had a sinking feeling in my stomach and I just felt ashamed uh, almost, say, so to speak, because I didn't feel I was actually meeting people's needs and um, like what I set out to do and the job that I intended to do in the first place. That's, that's so sad isn't it when, when you're just so busy and caught up in the doing that you don't get a chance to really reflect and think about what could be better here what is the art of the possible you know how could this you know how could this be better um and mm. and, and if a space is both safe and brave and you're able to stick your hand up and say what is going on around here you know yeah. but it, it sounds like that wasn't a space that was enabled for you and I wonder now with your experience of working in person-centred ways how you would enable that kind of environment in the future for others working because you're right it's the experience of all persons um, not just patients not just doctors not just nurses absolutely everybody that's involved in there so how would you influence that kind of environment now? Yeah I think um, for myself, it took a lot of growth as a person to find my own confidence and um, to find out who I am as a person. I sometimes feel that uh, when you put on a uniform and you're labelled as a healthcare support worker that you should just um, be that person and you, you aren't able to bring your own person out of that and I think it's not until I've been in this practice education role within the practice development team that I've fully understand what person-centeredness means what it means not just as a person but being within a team having a voice having a helpful culture to be part of to be part of a team that listens to you and values you so I think um, for the future I think it's about saying to people that you do have a voice um, um, that you should be able to speak up and and do it confidently but um, in a gentle challenge as well. 
Thank you for sharing that. And I know you enable that for people now through the development pathway work that you do into um, really personal centred induction to the to the role that you facilitate for others. And I imagine that for the future things will be different, you know, because mm-hmm. people feel 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 more enabled. And I think the thanks is down to people like you who have challenged, will go out, will seek to understand, will always work, you know, with sheer decision making and authentic engagement to ensure that um Things are better in the future and that person centeredness is held up as being important for all persons. So thank you for sharing that today and um, thanks for your time. No, thank you, Honor, for letting me share my story Um, and thank you for everyone for listening. This is a quote taken from um, Helen Bevan, thinking about the small, um, the small things that you can do. So often the small things make the biggest impact um, and it's the ripple effect from those small changes and the consistency around those small changes that really make the difference. This is the circle of control. Um, so focus your energy on what you can change. So that middle bit there is the circle of control where it's full control. So like your words and actions, how you can behave and respond, um, your efforts and ambitions, some stakes and learning, thoughts and enthusiasm and attitude and outlook. That's all you. That's all the thing. And I've seen some comments there in and around, you know, obviously some people being quite positive in and around, you know, their um, experience and where they work. But obviously that's not everyone's experience. <clears throat> and we're, we we do accept that we do know that that's difficult so and you can only control how you are uh, and role model in your own behavior um so and that's quite often when it starts um the circle of influence is some control so that's your relationships with others and um, you know things like staff retention you know <laughs> opportunities development all these things will will vary where you are but you worry less about those because it's not something you can control. And then there's a circle of concern where there's no control. Other people's behaviours and reactions, other people's mistakes and opinions, um, what the others think and say, people, what they're demanding of you. Um, so it's just a, it's just to kind of be aware that we are, we know that you can't do everything yourself. We know that um, what you can do sometimes is limited, uh, but maybe have a look to see what you can do within your area in terms of person-centred culture for what you can actually affect. There's just a, a bit more information um, in and around uh, for the reading of the stuff that we've used today, uh, Foundation Nursing Studies, which is often um, a good site for practice development stuff. Um, the person centered practice international international community of practice again person centeredness is the, the they are trying to promote that on an international level and then some of the references that we've used um today thanks thanks very much <laughs>